Hey everyone, welcome. We are so glad that you are with us today. Special shout out to those of you joining us for the first time. We are so glad that you're with us and hey, we are close to Christmas. So I don't know about you, but hopefully you're jamming to some Christmas music. So why don't you just to get the chat going, if you're chatting with us, why don't you throw up there, what is your favorite Christmas song. What is it? For me personally, have yourself a merry little Christmas. Love that song. But what's yours? Silent Night, Frosty the Snowman, Feliz Navidad. Whatever it is, throw it up there. No judgment unless it's Christmas shoes. Then I'm going to judge you because that is a super depressing song. But other than that, whatever it is, let us know what is the go-to Christmas song for you. And because it is Christmas, and we're coming to the end of the year. We just want to give you an opportunity to say thank you and show honor to some of the greatest senior pastors in the world. And that's our very own Pastor Jude and Becky. Man, we love them so much. And I don't know about you, but in a season like this, in a year that we've had, I'm grateful for the strong and steady leadership of our senior pastors. And for us at the end of the year, we would love for you to show honor and some love to our pastors to saying Merry Christmas and thank you for what you've done for us and how you've led us this year. So every year we give you opportunity as part of a Christmas gift. And if you want to financially bless Pastor Jude and Becky, I want to just encourage you that if you can do it this year and it's in your heart, man, would you do that? Go online and you can select in the drop down menu pastors offering or just put Pastor Jude and Becky and just a great way for us to say thank you. We love you and we appreciate you. And so Appreciate you doing that, City Church. And now we are in a series called Fear Not. If you're chatting with, with us, why don't you just chat that? Fear Not. And what we're looking at here is we're looking at the story of Christmas. And we're looking at, at three different occasions. An angel appears to three different people. To Mary, to Joseph, and to a group of shepherds. And in all of his interactions with them, he says the same phrase, fear not. Fear not. And so we're talking about fear. And how do we deal with and break out of some of the fears that try to come on our lives? Now, you can be afraid of a lot of things. You can be afraid of spiders. You can be afraid of snakes. You can be afraid of the dark. You can be afraid of clowns. If you're like my daughter, my youngest, one of my daughters, Sienna, you're deathly afraid of our city kid's mascot at our Ventura campus. He's a lion. If you ever hear at our Ventura campus and you hear some little girl screaming bloody murder, that's my, gir that's my girl, Sienna. She's scared of it. But you can be afraid of a lot of things. Today, we're going to talk about one thing. We're going to talk about one fear. We're going to talk about how do we overcome being afraid of what other people think about us? How do we overcome being afraid of what other people think about us? And we're going to look at the story of Joseph uh, in the book of Matthew chapter 1. And we're going to see in his journey how he had to break free and overcome being afraid of what other people thought about him. Not about you, let me ask you a question. How many of us would say you probably care a little bit too much about what people think about you? You just care a little bit too much. I mean, you, you care about what they think about your hair. You care about what, you, what they think about the job you have, the car you drive, the house you live in. You, you, you hope people think you're funny. You, you hope people invite you to things. You want people to like the stuff you post on social, on social media. I mean, how many of you, come on, there's a reason why you post something and then 10 seconds later you look at it again. It's not because you forgot what you posted. What are you looking for? You're looking for likes. You're looking for approval. Thumbs up. Fire emojis, retweets, reposts. Why? Because it's easy for us to become consumed, maybe easily obsessed with the way people uh, think about us, the way people see us. And what happens many times is if you're not careful, that, that pursuit, that even maybe obsession about the way people think about us can open up the door for fear. Because all of a sudden now we're actually afraid to do certain things or to live certain ways because we're going to be worried about what other people think about us. What are they going to say? What are they going to think? Are they going to judge me? And pretty soon it becomes this fear that keeps us from living some of the convictions that we have on the inside. It keeps us from starting something, from creating something, from starting to do something that God's put in your heart to do or to stop something that you feel like you should stop because you're afraid of what people think. Now, for some of us, we don't live that way. We kind of live the opposite way. The, the, like, I'm going to prove the haters wrong. Like you, some of us, we live this way. It's like, hey, forget everybody. I don't care what anybody thinks about me. I'm going to do me, and it's going to be in your face, and you're really outspoken about it. But if we really got to the core of it, the, even that kind of response in that life so is still rooted in the fact that you care about what people think about you. The only difference is because you did not get that, 
you have responded in this way of saying, look, I don't care what anybody thinks. But I think we can all kind of find some common ground, no matter how we kind of approach it. For some of us, we care a little bit too much about what other people think about us. It actually has become a fear of what other people think. So how do we, how do we break free from this? Like, how do we get past this? And so what we're going to see in this story of Joseph is God is going to ask Joseph to go on this journey. And it's going to be a journey where he's going to have a choice. Do I do what is easy or do I do what's right? Do I, do I do and live a life that pleases God or do I live a life that pleases people? And God is going to ask Joseph to make some decisions and to live a life that is going to bring judgment and criticism from other people. So we're going to pick it up here in Matthew chapter 1, but before we get there, let me set some context for you. It's going to say that Joseph at this point is engaged to Mary. Now engagement back then is a little bit different than what we do now. Like engagement now is like if you get engaged and it doesn't work off, you break it out, no harm, no foul, give me the ring back, and we just maybe lose a security deposit. But back in those days, an engagement was a binding agreement. First of all, you had to be engaged for a year. And the only two ways you could get out of engagement was a divorce or death. You literally had to apply for a divorce to break an engagement off or you died. And if your fiance actually died during that year-long engagement, you were actually considered a widow or a widower. So we're talking about a serious commitment here that both Joseph and Mary and So understanding the context of being engaged, here we go, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. It says, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. So while this is all happening, in the midst of this year-long engagement, there's this moment, we, we actually heard about this last week in Pastor Jude's message, that Mary becomes pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Man, and can we appreciate the, the moment here that Joseph finds himself. Now, I don't know about you, but maybe you're somebody, I, I hate drama. I, I don't like drama. I don't like to watch reality shows because it's too much drama for me. Like, it drives me crazy. But maybe for some of you, like, you love drama. I mean, you are all about Bravo Network. You are about The Bachelor, The Bachelorette. Like, you want drama. You would have loved to have been in this moment where Mary's going to tell Joseph, hey, I'm pregnant, but don't worry. It's the Holy Spirit. Like, can you imagine what that looked like? Can you imagine how Joseph must have felt and how he is processing right now? Wait, wait, you're, you're pregnant. It's not somebody else, other guy. It's the Holy Spirit. I mean, if you're drama, that's where you want to be. Can we appreciate maybe the thought process of jo Joseph here? That he's hearing this. And let's put aside that maybe this was God. So if it's not God, if I'm Joseph, she's either, Mary is either crazy or she's a liar. Right? And I don't know about you, but I don't want to marry crazy, and I don't want to marry a liar. And, and he's got to think of it this way as well, that what are people going to think if he decides to stay with Mary? What are people going to think? Like, how are people going to see them? Because the reality is, Mary now, in, in the natural, is marked for life. She's going to be seen as someone that got pregnant out of wedlock. And in those days, that was punishable by death. They would have stoned her. So she's marked for life as far as Joseph's concerned. And if Joseph stays with her, Joseph's thinking, I'm marked for life as well. Because if I stick with her and stay with it, people are always going to know, hey, wait, he either got her pregnant or somebody else did and he's raising somebody else's son. And in that culture, if that's the case, Joseph would have it, would be very hard for Joseph to get a job because of this. It would actually be hard for Joseph to do business with anybody. They wouldn't do business with you. He'd take his donkey to the local, you know, a shop to get it, the oil chains. They'll be like, oh, I'm sorry. We don't work on that kind of donkey. Like, and if he divorces Mary, there will be fathers that will never give their approval for their daughters to marry Joseph. This is his moment. Now, at the end of the day, we don't know what Joseph's thinking, but we do know what Joseph plans to do. He's going to bail. He's going to leave. Either it's because he doesn't believe Mary or he just can't take the heat. But this is what happens and this is what he plans to do in, in verse 19 of chapter 1. It says, Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man. And he did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. We learned something about Joseph. He loved Mary. He really did, and he cared about Mary. And he didn't want to publicly humiliate her. He didn't put her in a position where she would have to be murdered. 
or killed. So what's he decide? You know what? I'll divorce her. I'll do it privately. He's probably thinking, look, she'll probably move somewhere else, have the baby, start over. I'll go somewhere. I'll start over. And we'll just kind of move on from this weird, awkward moment. But in the next verse, Joseph's going to learn one of life's most important lessons. And that's this. Pleasing God often means disappointing other people. That there are moments when you're going to have a decision to make. Do I choose a life that pleases God or do I choose a life that pleases people? Do I live a life that pleases God? That's probably hard. Or do I choose an easier life that succumbs to the pressure and the opinion of people? See, every, every one of us is going to have a moment. We have to learn this lesson. Pleasing God often means disappointing people. That there are going to be moments where God is going to ask you to do something and there are going to be people who don't understand and who don't under, understand and don't agree with that decision. So let's pick it up here. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. It says this, that as he, Joseph, considers this, an angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel says, do not be afraid. New King James Version says, fear not. If you're, with, if you're still chatting with us, chat, fear not, fear not. Do not be afraid to, marry, to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son. And you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Wow, man. So Joseph has a dream. And this angel appears and says, hey, fear not. What Mary is saying is true. She's going to have a son. You're going to call him Jesus, and he's going to be the savior of the world. Joseph, the person you have been waiting for for centuries is coming, and you get to play a part in it. I mean, can we consider the emotional roller coaster here of Joseph? Like, on one end, it's like the person he has been waiting for, that they've been waiting centuries for, that is going to free his people from, like, tyranny and oppression, is finally here, and he gets to play a part. But on the other end, nobody's going to believe me. I'm going to get criticized. No one's going to understand. No one's going to fully comprehend. No one's going to believe that an angel appeared to me. How am I going to explain it? But on the other side, God's going to use me. Like God, me, Joseph, carpenter from nowhere is going to be used by God in a great way. But man, I feel like it's going to cost me a lot. Like I don't think it's going to be easy. I think it's going to be hard and difficult. Is he going to do what God wants him to do? Or is he going to take the easy route? Is he going to try to please God? Or is he going to try to please other people? You have to understand something. There will be multiple times in yours and my journey where we're going to be faced with a decision like Joseph. And do I make a decision to please God and do what's right? Or do I succumb to the pressure of people's opinions and do what's easy? You have a choice to make. It's so important. Why is it so important? Why are we talking about this? Why is it so important? Here's why it's so important. Because becoming obsessed with what other people think about you is the quickest way to forget what God thinks about you. I'm going to say it again. Becoming obsessed with what other people think about you is the quickest way to forget what God says about you. For some of us, we've lived a life now for so long where we are pursuing and trying to attain the approval of people. Or we're trying to get to a place where we don't feel judgment or criticism. That we've forgotten who God says we are. And for some of us, we've actually just kind of lost our bearings. We don't, we don't know who we are anymore. We, we, we've lost our North Star. We've become disoriented. We, we, we don't understand. We've lost some of our identity because we've gone down this journey and this path of trying to find acceptance from other people. So how do we get past this? Like, how do we overcome it? Now, now the beautiful thing is the exact opposite is true as well. That becoming obsessed with what God thinks about you is the quickest way to forget what other people think about you. Becoming obsessed with what God thinks about you is the quickest way to forget what other people say about you or what other people think about you. Man, when you live a life for the audience of one, it sets you free. 
And no matter what people have said about you in your past or what people have thought about you or might think about you in the future, if you become obsessed, concerned, preoccupied, focused on what God thinks about you, it is the quickest way to forget what other people think about you. And here's the truth. You know it to be true. I know it to be true. It's very, very obvious. You can never live a life where you please everyone. It's not possible. Every decision you make, you're going to have people who like it, and you got people who dislike it. You get a new haircut. There are going to be people who love the new hair. There are going to be people that hate the new hair. The, uh, the name for your future child you have chosen, there are going to be people who love that name. And there are going to be people who hate that name, right? Your new outfit, there are going to be people who love it. There's going to be people who don't like it. Your stance on masks, there are going to be people who strongly agree with the way you with way you believe, and there'll be people who strongly disagree. Your stance politically, there are going to be people that agree with you, and there are going to be people that disagree with you. You cannot live a life where you please everyone, but you can live a life where you please God. You can never live a life where you please everyone, but you can live a life where you please God. Living for the audience of one is how we break free from that fear of what everyone else thinks about us. And we make a decision. I'm going to live a life that pleases God, not a life that pleases other people. So Joseph's going to have to go on this journey, and we're going to continue with him. This journey of, hey, are you going to please God? Or are you going to please people? Because Joseph, you're not going to be able to please everybody. You can't live a life where you please God. So how does this play out in our everyday lives, right? So how do we apply this tomorrow? How do you begin to live this? How do you begin to break free from the fear or from being afraid of what other people think? Let me give you two thoughts for you to apply in your everyday life. Here's the first thought. If you're ready to be used by God, you have to be ready to be criticized for your obedience to God. If you're ready, you're like, look, I'm ready. I'm ready to be used by God. Then you have to be ready. You have to be okay with being criticized for your obedience to God. I mean, Joseph and Mary are going to say yes. I can only imagine the criticism and the judgment that they went through during this time. I mean, imagine them just walking down the street and what people are saying. Like, you see Mary and Joseph? You know that's, that's not his baby, right? You know that ain't his. Or they're saying, you know what they said, right? They're saying it's the Holy Spirit. Like, yeah, it's the Holy Spirit, all right. Yeah, I saw Joseph's donkey like six months ago outside Mary's apartment at 2 a.m. And I'll tell you what they weren't doing. They weren't doing a Bible study right? You can imagine what they were saying. You can imagine what people were talking about, how people were judging them, family members, friends, strangers. But guess what? If you are ready to be used by God, you have to be ready to accept criticism for your obedience. Okay? I I don't know how your life is going to play out. I do know this. There will be moments where you'll be reading your Bible, or maybe in prayer, or maybe in your city group, having a discussion, or maybe in, in a church service or when you're watching online and God is going to drop something on the inside of you and you're going to know it's God. He's going to tell you to do something. He's going to tell you to do something. And you know that if you do this thing that God wants you to do, it is culturally unpopular. And if you obey what God is telling you to do, you're going to get criticized. You might get judged. Like there are going to be some of you, you're going to be here in this journey of life. God's going to begin to speak to you about certain things. For some of you, God's going to begin to speak to you. Say, hey, listen, that party lifestyle, the way you used to live, I just don't want you to do it anymore. I want you to stop. I want you to begin to live this way. And you're going to feel conviction, not because some pastor in a pulpit told you to do it, but you know that God is really putting it on the inside of you that I want you to live this way. I don't want you to do this anymore. And you're going to make that decision. And your very closest friends, the ones you've been hanging out with, the one that party, and they're going to judge you. They're going to criticize you. They're going to say, what are you, you, what are you Mr. Holier than now? What are you, you Miss, Miss Perfect now? You're going to judge us? You're not, are, we too, are you too good for us now? They're going to judge you. They're going to criticize you because you're going to be obedient to what God is telling you to do. For some of you, he's going to say, listen, I want you to be sexually pure. I want you to wait till you get married. I want you to stop. I want you to just set time aside. And until you get married, I want you to be pure. And you're going to make that decision. And there will be people in your life, people around you, people that you don't even know, that will have no idea or understanding of the decision you made. And they'll make fun of you. They'll criticize you. They'll say something, oh, what, are you going to be a monk now? You're going to be a, a nun? You're going to live in a convent? Like, what's the big deal? I don't understand why this is something. Like, this is so old school. This is like 1940s. We're in the new, a, new, a new age, buddy. You can do whatever you want. 
You're going to get judged, but you're going to do it because you know it's the obedient thing to do, that God is telling you to do it, and you're going to obey. For some of you, you have a high-paying job, and someday God might tell you, hey, listen, I'm going to want you to take this position. It's less money, but it's part of an organization that's making a difference in the society, and you're going to feel a call, and you're going to feel a passion to be a part of it, and so you're going to leave this high-paying job to do this thing, and people are going to say, what are you doing? Are you crazy? Are you thinking about your future? Are you thinking about college for your kids one day? Why are you leaving this great-paying job? But you know in your heart that's what God wants you to do, and so you're you're going to be obedient, but people are probably going to criticize you. Or maybe for some of you, you're going, to, you're going to continue to have your job, but you're going to make a decision because you feel a conviction in your heart that you and your family are going to live below your, below your means so that you have more money that you can sacrificially give, and people will have no idea why you're doing that. Wait, you're going to give money to a church? You're going to give money to other people? Why don't you just buy another house? Why don't you just buy another car? Why, you made the money. You earned it. It's yours. You're going to get criticized because you're going to be obedient to what God tells you to do. Hey, if you're ready to be used by God, you have to be ready to take criticism for your obedience to God. But can I tell you something about criticism? Let me just say, anything that ever was accomplished in a great way always brought on criticism. Anybody who's ever done something in this world has had to endure pain that other people were unwilling to endure. Like, if you don't want to have pain, if you don't want to endure criticism, don't stand for anything, don't stick up for anything, just go along with the flow. But if you want God to use you in a real strategic way, in your family, in your neighborhood, in your work, in our nation, in this state, then you have to be ready to take a step of faith and obedience and know it's going to come. But you're like, bring it on. Anytime, me personally, or even as our church, we have done anything significant for the kingdom of God, it has always been met with spiritual resistance and criticism. But you know what? Bring it on. Bring it on. Bring it on. Because we know it's part of it. In fact, we, we feel like at, at our church, if we're not occasionally called a cult, like there's something wrong then. Like, you, we should, probably should occasionally be called that because we're doing something significant in our city. We're doing something significant in our world. As we have navigated this season of COVID, every decision that we have made, we have made under, under uh, a time where we have prayed, we have fasted, we have sought the face of God. Every decision, whether it was to go online completely, whether it was to open again, whether it was to stay indoors, whether it was to bring back prayer, do groups, everything we did, we did because we feel like God told us to do it and we are being obedient. And every time we made the decision, there was criticism, both inside of the church and outside the church. Oh, you're not having any faith. Oh, you're not standing up for the name of Jesus. You're succumbing to fear. Oh, you don't care about what people's health every single time. But you know what? Here's as a church, as a staff, we know God, is, we are doing something significant for the kingdom of God. So we say bring on the criticism because if you want to be used by God and you're ready to be used by God, you have to be ready to receive criticism for your obedience to God. So bring it on. Thought number two, extraordinary acts of God start with ordinary acts of obedience. Oftentimes, extraordinary acts of God start with ordinary acts of obedience. Consider it. The savior of the world comes to the earth as a result of two young people saying yes to what God asked them to do. Might I add, they said yes to something they did not have all the details to. I mean, they're about to parent the savior of the world with very little detail on how to do it. I, I remember when I forged kids, and I remember though bringing on my firstborn son, Ford, and I remember coming back from the hospital with page after page, tons of literature on how to raise this kid. I mean, how to change a diaper, how, how to burp him, how to feed him, how to put the diaper on, how, how to uh, analyze the poop. I had charts on how to chart his bowel movements. I, I had, uh, had all this stuff about um, how to swaddle and how to put in the car seat and how to take care of my wife. And there was this really encouraging sheet on SIDS, which is an awesome thing to read when you're a first time parent. And had all this literature to bring home to read. Mary and Joseph are going to raise the savior of the world. And the only detail they get, call him Jesus. That's it. You're going to raise the savior of the world and you call him Jesus. Um, I have a few more questions, angel. Like, okay, so when it comes to discipline, 
do, do, do we discipline him or, you know, he's going to be perfect. So do we let him discipline us? Like, like, I mean, you know, what if he doesn't want to get a bath and he does the whole floating on water thing? Like, I got more questions. Yet they just simply obeyed what God told them to do. Because oftentimes, extraordinary acts of God start with ordinary acts of obedience. For some of us, we're, we're hesitant. We know what God wants us to do, but we're hesitant because we want more details. Like we know the first step, but we're like, God, can you give me more? I need more than just what you told me. And many times God said, look, I'm not going to give you any more details because you, you just can't handle it. But what we learn from Joseph and Mary is that I don't have to understand fully in order to obey completely. I don't have to understand fully to obey completely what God tells me to do right now. You have no idea what you will set in motion from one act of obedience. One act of obedience from a young man and one young lady brought on the savior of the world. You have no idea what one act of obedience in your life will set in motion. My life was changed and impacted because of a few people's ordinary acts of obedience. There's one particular one that comes to mind. His name was Lou. Lou, this was decades ago. Lou would start going to a gym in Youngstown, Ohio. And when he would get to the gym, he would meet this young man who was one of the owners, him and his brother owned this gym. And he felt like God put it in his heart to tell this young man about Jesus and to invite him to church. So Lou was obedient to what God told him to do and he would witness to him. He would tell him, this young man about Jesus. And what did this young man do? Did he get down on his knees and weep and cry and say, I'm a sinner, please take me to church. No, guess what he did? He criticized him. He mocked him. He made fun of him. When Lou would work out, he'd throw supplements at him just to mess with him. And every time Lou would come in, he'd make fun of him. He'd be extra vulgar. He'd just get really intense. But every time Lou would come back, he'd tell this young man about Jesus because that's what God told him to do. And he was met with criticism until one day, one day, that young man would allow Lou to lead him to Jesus. And then that young man would lead his entire family to Jesus. And then that young man would go to Oklahoma to Bible college. He would come back to Ohio to start a church where one day my parents, Michael and Janet, would bring their two sons, myself and my brother Josh, to that church. And it would be in that church I'd learn about Jesus. It'd be in that church I would have my own relationship and give my life to Jesus. It would be in that church where I would begin to discover who God made me to be and the calling that he placed on the inside of me. It'd be in that church I would meet my future wife. And someday I would be sent out from that church and I would be right where I am right now in front of you. All because a guy named Lou in Youngstown, Ohio said yes to God telling him, just witness to this one young man. You have no idea what you will set into motion from one act of obedience. You have no idea what will you set into motion if you simply invite that person to church that you know you've been needing to invite to church. You have no idea what you're going to set into motion for that one person that you know you need to tell your testimony of what God did to your life. You need to tell, and you're afraid, and you're nervous. And why are you afraid? Because you're not sure what they're going to say. You're not sure what they're going to think. You're not sure how they're going to judge you. You're not sure in this whole PC culture that we live in now, if it's even right or appropriate, that can you even do it in the workplace? But you know that is what God has told you to do, and you have no idea what's going to set into motion in that person's life, in their family, in this generation, in this state, from one act of obedience. You never know what you're going to set in motion the moment you decide to serve on a team and you begin to serve at our church or the church you're at and all of a sudden God's going to do something on the inside of you and there's going to be opening up new levels of ministry and anointing and grace on your life and you're going to get a vision and you're going to get refreshed and God's going to do something on the inside of you and it's going to bless all these people and it's going to make more room for what God wants to do in your city and in your church all from one act of obedience. You have no idea what you set into motion the moment you decide, you know, I'm going to begin to give and I'm going to begin to tithe and I'm going to be a blessing. You have no idea what's going to do on the inside of you and the room it's going to make and the vision that God's going to give you and the God ideas to make more money because you've been stewarding what God already gives you. You have no idea what you set into motion when you are obedient to God. Extraordinary acts of God often start with ordinary acts 
of obedience. The Savior of the world came as a result of two young people saying yes. Look, I don't know where you're at today. My, my prayer for you is this. I pray that you break free from being afraid of what other people think about you. Because becoming obsessed with what other people think about you is the quickest way to forget what God thinks about you. But becoming obsessed with what God thinks about you is the quickest way, the quickest way to forget what other people think about you. So what does Joseph decide to do? The last verse, one of my favorite verses in this story. Then Joseph woke up in verse 24. Then Joseph woke up. He did as the angel of the Lord commanded and he took Mary as his wife. Destiny altering decision. A destiny defining statement. He did what the Lord told him to do. I don't know where you're at. But I believe for some of you, God has already begun to speak to you about some things he wants you to do. But you've been hesitant because you know if you do them, they're culturally unpopular and people won't understand and people won't agree. But you have to remember this important lesson about life. Pleasing God often means disappointing other people. For some of you, God's gonna begin to speak to you about what he wants you to do, something he wants you to start to do, something he wants you to stop doing, something he wants you to pioneer, something he wants you to build, a different way to respond to somebody, a different way to approach a relationship. And you know if you do it, you're gonna get criticism. Remember, if you're ready to be used by God, you have to be ready to receive criticism for your obedience to God. And you need to obey. Because extraordinary acts of God start with ordinary acts of obedience. And you may not have all the details and you don't know how it's all going to play out. But I don't need to understand fully in order to obey immediately. And I'll begin to break free from that fear of what other people think. Because the quickest way one of the quickest ways to, to move past that, and we'll say it like this again, being obsessed with what God thinks about you is the quickest way to forget what other people think about you. I'm gonna pray for you today. I'm gonna pray whatever God is speaking you to do, you're gonna be graced, you're gonna have a courage, and you're gonna see God do incredible things because you have no idea in active obedience what sets in motion. Father, I thank you for the people watching right now. God, I think you don't just speak to one person, you speak to everyone. And whatever you're telling them to do right now, I pray a boldness and a courage that they would live out everything that you've called them to live out. God, I ask for a boldness to, to break past the fear of what other people think. God, may there be a grace and a divine focus and just a, a, an obsession with what you think about them. God, I thank you they're gonna have the courage to, to do the right thing even when it's hard. And God, I thank you for the supernatural working miracles that are gonna happen as a result of their obedience. I pray courage into them. I pray strength into them. I pray boldness into them. And God, I think that as a result, God, you are gonna do great things in their life, in their marriage, in their family, in their neighborhood, in their school, in their workplace, in their city, their county, their state, their nation, the world, as a result of their obedience to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, before I let you go, I'm going to give you one invitation. And that is to know personally this God that we've been talking about today. Maybe you don't know him personally. You're hearing about him and you're intrigued. You hear about a God that does extraordinary works, a God who we can live to please, a God that loves us, but you don't know him personally. I want to invite you to know him. See, the reason why Jesus came and why we are so grateful that Joseph and Mary said yes to what God asked them to do is because there becomes a, there is now a way for us to know God personally. And God can do the greatest work ever. And that is to save us from our sin because we've made mistakes. And because of that, we've been disconnected from God and we can't fully live a life of knowing who he is and discovering who he made us to be. But because of Jesus, because he was obedient 
He didn't just come to the earth, but he died on a cross. Because Jesus was obedient, the greatest work that can ever happen is a human being being saved from their sin. They can be reconnected to God and have a relationship with him. And in that way, we have a meaning and we have a destiny and we have a future and we have a hope. I want to invite you to have that moment today. But you know what it takes? An act of obedience. And the Bible says that when I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I'm saved. I'm made new. It's saying that when I make a decision, say, look, I'm going to believe in Jesus. I know that the only way for me to be made right with God is, be, is to believe in Jesus, that he was the son of God. I can't do enough to earn it. I don't deserve it. It's only because of Jesus. And I believe that he was not just a good man, but the savior of the world. And then you believe, you put your trust, you, you make God the leader of your life. What you're saying is, God, look, I am going to live a life that pleases you. I'm not going to live a life that tries to please other people. When you make that decision, God does the most extraordinary work on the inside of you. He brings you back to life. And you have a hope and you have a passion and you're gonna have a new vision for your life. I wanna invite you to have that moment today. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. The prayer is just words, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you words that are gonna go along with what you're feeling on the inside. So if that's you today and you wanna make that decision to know God personally, say this prayer after me. Say, thank you, God, for Jesus. I believe that he was your son. Father, forgive me of my sins. I make you the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you made that decision, we are so excited for you. It is the greatest decision you will ever make. Something new has started on the inside of you and it's real. And you know what? Now that you've made it, you might get criticized for it. You might get judged. People might say, no, you're the same person. You're not, you're not, you're new. You've got a new hope and a new future because Jesus lives on the inside of you now. And as a church, we'd love to connect with you and help you take next steps of what it looks like now to live out this life that's new and different and full of hope. So you're gonna see all over our different platforms, different links or opportunities for you to click. And hey, let us know you made that decision and we're gonna reach out to you and help you take next steps. We pray that God has so much more in store for you. We're excited for what God has for you. We wanna invite you, if you ever wanna come to a service in live at our Ventura campus, check us out. We love you. Merry Christmas. Have a great day.